<laughs> okay, let's resume. Of all units that I teach here at the seminary, the next one is the one that fills me with most fear and trembling. I like teaching at least, and yet I feel that what it covers is what is most important for modern people like you and me. Subordination is the topic. Um, and if there's one word that gets people seeing red of my generation, I don't know about your generation, it's this word and what's connected with it. Um, now, um, the reason I want to spend time on it is because it touches one, what I would call is a spiritual blind spot. Every generation has its spiritual blind spot. Now, blind spot is, you, you know, your vision's good, except that there's one place where you don't see things clearly. It's distorted. A blind spot. Um, okay, let, let me go straight into it. And... Uh, no matter what your reaction is, just give me a hearing, please, and then we'll see how we go. Um, put it to you bluntly, one of the most significant features of my spiritual life is and always has been my attitude to authority. Now, it's so important because as a pastor, I'm called to exercise authority. And I put it to you that you cannot possibly exercise authority unless you are under authority. Only those who are under authority can exercise authority. Or, to put it in a different way, anybody who's called to exercise power in the church, who is not under authority, is in grave, grave spiritual peril, um, is basically open to terrible attack by the evil one. So this leads right to the heart of spiritual warfare. Authority, the question of authority. Satan's motto is, I will not submit. I will not be subordinate. Um, now, what's the basic problem that we face within the church, not outside the church? This is a teaching that has its primary focus for Christians. I don't know whether you realise that once you become a Christian, the old Adam, the old self, has a far greater scope to do even greater evil than any pagan person. The sins of the spirit are far worse than the sins of the flesh. Even the worst sins of the flesh, like murder and all the terrible sexual aberrations that we see in our society, the sins of the spirit are far worse than that. Pride, arrogance. And the worst sins of the spirit are the sins of office. The sins in which I abuse a holy office. The world knows that. And that's why the world is holding the church to account in a way that we haven't seen for hundreds of years to the whole issue of sexual abuse on the hands, not just of Christians, but of clergy. The abuse of office there. It's not just abuse of position, secular position, but it's an abuse of holy office that's involved here. Now, the basic problem that I have as a pastor, as a theologian, is the scope for self-promotion that I have in the church. Um, you see, what do I really want? Is I want to get my way with other people, of course, on behalf of God. I know the will of God, and I use that so that I can get my way with other people, with you, my wife, my kids. Um, behind getting my way with others is my desire to exercise power over others. And if you don't realise, the most powerful power there is, is spiritual power. You can influence people far deeper spiritually than you can do politically, if I can put it that way. Spiritual power. 
And it means that if you have spiritual power, you can get your way with other people. You can use power for your own benefit and other people's detriment. But most of all, my greatest temptation is that I want the glory for myself. There's a scope for me as a Christian, as a pastor, as a theologian, to uh, make a name for myself, to get become popular, to work so that people will admire me, so that I get glory. So the hardest part of the Lord's Prayer for me to pray is the last part, the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, not mine. Original sin. Okay, that's the problem here. An original sin in its spiritual dimension. Uh, that I want to be my own God. Of course, in, in a holy way. I will use God's word, the Holy Spirit, to get my will, my, my power, my glory. Now what's God's solution to this tendency in each one of us? Uh, God has a funny sense of humour. And he deals with us in an odd way. So I want to be a spiritual high flyer. I want to be a great Billy Graham or great theologian. I want to establish a mega church, write great theological tracts. Um, I want to be a spiritual high flyer and get other people to look up to me and serve me. How does God deal with that? Well, he serves me. He doesn't knock. I would have expected him to knock me off my perch. But what does he do? He turns it around and serves me. Um, uh, and by his service of me, he removes the need for my own self-promotion and self-assertion. If God honours me in a way that I, no human being can, if God gives me gifts if God gives me everything I need, if God cares for me, then I don't have to look after number one anymore. I have everything I need as a gift. And it comes to me at the cost of the death of Jesus the Son. So Jesus serves me to the point of dying for me. And what does he give? He gives me everything that I need. And means that I don't have to go chasing these things anymore. Then secondly, the second stage to that second part to that, is that he uh, uh, puts me in my station in life. You know, I want power. I want to, I, I always think big, big picture stuff. If only I could convert the whole world, bring the whole world back to God. If only I could be the Messiah and save everybody. If only I could straighten out the mess in the world. Okay? Rowan Williams, the present uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, calls it that uh, the labels that the imperial self that wants to have rule over the whole world. What does God do? He grounds me. Do you remember when you played up as kids, teenagers? Parents grounded you. Well, God grounds me. How does God ground me? He grounds me by putting me in a particular place with a particular vocation. So uh, instead of me dealing with the whole world, he gives me a wife. He gives me children, in-laws, grandchildren, brothers, sisters, colleagues, students. He puts me in my place and he keeps me in my place. Um, uh, and in that location, he uses others to curb my old self with its desire for self-gratification, dominance, and importance. So who's best at taking the mickey out of me? My wife and my kids, and they do it in the nicest possible. Say, sometimes it's less nice, but as soon as I have delusions of grandeur, Spiritual grandeur, that is, not physical grandeur. I can't pull off that act anymore. As <laughs> uh, uh, soon as I have delusions of grandeur, uh, Claire pricks the balloon. All my kids mock me. 
And they, they, they know me far better than you guys do, and they can do it far better than you. But even if they don't do it, you do it to me. But you see, what, what God does is puts us in relationships with others uh, to cut us down to size and to keep us in size. So we get the balance, not negatively, so we are, uh, are destroyed. Um, and, 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 or, but the other hand, he doesn't let us pander our, he doesn't let other people pander our illusions. He gets us to have a realistic appraisal of ourselves. So he uses other people's people to cut us down to size and to keep us modest, humble, a human. On the other hand, then he uses other people to build us up. Now, I want to be the Messiah to other people. What does God do? Chooses the most unlikely people to be Messiah to me. And that's experience of life. So he puts you in your station in life. You know Luther's notion of station? Your particular location. With particular people in particular places with particular tasks to do. And um, that's the most important part of your spirituality. Now, in your location, wherever it is... Oh, I thought I had a blank part here. Uh, within your lo okay, I won't write it. Within the location that you have, um, this yeah, if you could just clean that for me, um, God gives you responsibility for other people. There are people who are, if you like, to use inadequate language, there's people that are under you, there's people on, alongside of you, and there's people over you. And uh, always there's going to be a balance between those. You'll never be in a position where you're just over other people without being under someone else. So let me just illustrate uh, for me. So, uh, who am I under? You. Pastor yes, me. Yes. Henderson. Pastor Henderson. Very important. District President. District President Rob Voigt. The church. National President. The church. Um, so uh, Mark Semler, but I'm also together with and under all other pastors. I'm part of a pastorate. That's part of my subordination. Who else am I under? In a way, yes, that's true. But then my parents, my grandparents, but in my congregation in Glenelg, who am I? What's my status there? I'm under David Altus. I don't. So I'm under somebody or under people, but I'm also over people in the sense of being responsible for others. I have responsibility, my primary responsibility is to my wife, my children, my in-laws, my grandchildren. That's the most fundamental level, but it goes bigger than that. Okay. Now, um, which means that basically God has designed us in such a way that we're meant to live in community. And it isn't any community. He doesn't just throw people together in a disordered kind of way and they each find their place because if you throw people together just as a mob, what's going to happen? Human beings being what they are? Hmm? You're going to have anarchy and who's going to come out on top? The strongest come out on top and the weakest ones are going to be exploited. So power, you'll get power gains, and power will destroy community, power destroys love. All through human community. And what power does is basically isolates people. It doesn't create community, it isolates uh, community. Now, um, uh, there's a wonderful teaching in the New Testament which is very unfashionable, and that's the teaching on subordination. Okay, now I'll go back here again. Uh, let me just give you some uh, of the basic language <coughs> here before I go into it. Um, tasso is to order, to arrange something, to put something in order. You know, things are chaotic and what you do, you tasso it, you put it back in place. You, know, you put it in the right order. So it's not just any order, but the, always the idea is that there's some right order. Uh, 
you know, the books are out of the shelf, you put them back in the shelf. There's rubbish on the floor, you sweep it and put it in the rubbish bin. You order things. There's a place. There's a right place for things. That's the word tasso. Now, uh, the important word here is hippo tasso. Now, hippo is under. You put something in order under somebody or something. You get the basic picture? So it's in the right order under somebody. And then um, the word for order is taxus. Taxus. Now, originally in Greek, this was a military term, taxus. So if you look at classic, classical Greek, it comes from something that the Greeks invented. They were clever guys. And they, before them, basically, when people went into battle, you know, you drew up a line of soldiers, and then you know, everybody just rushed and did their own thing. The Greeks basically arranged their soldiers in units. And the Romans picked it up and perfected it. So in, when the New Testament was written, if anybody heard the word taxus, they would think of the Roman century. The Roman century. Now, the, the century was the smallest unit in the Roman army. A hundred soldiers, hence century. And the soldiers typically would be lined up like this, in an order. Okay? And classically speaking, there'd be at least three rows. Now, why no more? Because the bigger the unit, the harder it is to maneuver it. It's the harder it is, the less flexible it becomes. So they arranged it in what were called hundreds. Not that it was always a hundred soldiers, but that was the term of the basic unit. Three rows. Now, uh, and the basic equipment of the Roman soldier was a great big shield, a body shield that went from here down to at least to the knee, and would. Hmm? And the other basic weapon was the gladius, the two-edged sword, which was the number one weapon that they had. That also have other stuff like spears and uh, other things, but the gladius, the sword, and the shield were the basic stock in trade. Now. Um, the centurion was the officer in charge of the unit. Um, do you know where the centurion was located? That's modern warfare. Right at the front. And where at the front? Right at the center. He would lead from in front. So this is no chain of command stuff where the, where the officer is at headquarters and gives commands to soldiers who do all the fighting. So um, uh, uh, this is the basic picture. Now, um, what would happen is that there would be a solid wall here of shields. Um, the enemy wouldn't see anything except the helmets, faces, and shields of the soldiers. And the shields would, would link across so that there'd be no space between the shields. They, and the soldiers here this side would put their shields this side, and the soldiers at the top would do what? Back here? They would put at the top, and they would form what was called a tortoise. I don't know if you know anything about Roman, a tortoise, which was a kind of a mobile tank, uh, which meant that if they fired arrows, and this was one of the ways to try it. Initially, the, the, uh, the way that other uh, armies broke through the old Greek lines was before they perfected the tortoise, that was more Roman than Greek, uh, they'd just fire arrows and break up the line from a distance. They wouldn't even engage. Um, so the Parthians were experts at the back of, back of horses, riding back to front, and they'd shoot arrows, and they'd never engage. They'd always retreat and uh, knock them off from firing arrows. Well, this was a simple technique to uh, defeat that. Now, let's say this soldier was wounded or killed, what would happen? The next one would, if he was wounded, he'd go at the back. If he was dead, then they'd pull him at the back and then everybody would step forward. Do you know where they would place the most experienced soldiers? No. 
No, you'd expect at the back the front line because they were had the they they had the experience. They were hardened ones. The young soldiers, the new soldiers, were always placed at the back, so they weren't introduced to it right at the beginning. This thing. Now, what was the name given to this? Uh, okay, that's a century, and the order for this is the Taxus. Now, uh, uh, the Roman centurion would therefore not just tasso his soldiers, which is line them up, but what would he do? He would hippotasso them, which means? Order it under and around him. Notice it's not necessarily, it's not a hierarchical thing necessarily, not a hierarchy of distance chain of command, but they were ordered under him and around him. So subordination under him, coordination around him. They were ordered around him and under him. Uh, uh, they would not do their own thing. He was here so that they would do what this, he would give the signal for them to attack or whatever the case would be. They would be subordinate to him. Do you get the basic picture? Now, that's where the, this language comes from. It's military language. Now, it's interesting that this military language was carried over uh, by the translators into the, of the Septuagint into the arrangement of priests at the temple in Jerusalem. So it became liturgical language. And it, it, it basically then denoted liturgical order. Because, say, take the priests and in Jerusalem, you had the priests, you had the Levites, big building, lots of tasks to do. Each person had their own task. They were rostered on at particular periods of time. They were rostered to do a particular task. They had a particular place in which they did their work within the whole temple and within the divine service. So uh, uh, Psalm 110 talks about... Uh, the coming Messiah as being a priest not after the order of Levi but the order of Melchizedek. I know the term order here has liturgical order basically priestly order. Now that's the origin of the language. Any questions about that? And I want you to see it clearly because one of the problems that we have is with language and the fact that language uh, uh, very often uh, loses its meaning and people merely have associations and connotations to it which are very often misleading. There's just one other, t two other terms that I'd like to touch before I begin. Now, hippotasso means what? To arrange in the right order under, the or under somebody else. So there's somebody in charge, there's somebody responsible. Um, now the person who is they are under is called the head. And the picture now is bodily language. So you get the picture of various parts of the body being arranged in the right order under the head. So headship and subordination go together. Now, what's interesting is that the New Testament hardly ever uses the active verb here, and it's only used of God. It's never used of human beings, theologically. So human, no human being subordinates another human being to anybody or anything. Um, it's used passively for God. God puts people in their place under somebody else. But the, n the normal way that Paul and Peter uses this is in the middle sense. Now the middle sense is uh, to, no, it's, it's reflexive, to put yourself in your in order under somebody else. So it's a voluntary thing. So uh, 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 if Paul talks about the subordination of children to parents, he'd say, you children subordinate yourself to your parents. Which means, no, uh, take your place, the right, the place that's given for you within your family under your parents. So it's a voluntary activity. Okay, now, now I want to follow this through and the implications of this, at least start off today. I would put to you that subordination and community go like that. You can't have community without subordination. Uh, subordination makes community.
community possible. Um, and particularly good community, healthy community, where there's room for love to develop. Um, the verb hippotasa, I said, is to put somebody in position under someone else's head or under authority. Uh, you get this in the story of the New Testament where a centurion comes to Jesus uh, praying Jesus to heal his sick servant. Remember that in Luke chapter 7? Uh, and uh, uh, Jesus asks him what he wants to do and he says, well, look, I'm a man under authority uh, and he says, just speak the word and your servant will be healed. But notice there, he says, I am a man ordered under authority uh, with soldiers under me. Now notice, he is ordered under, so there's somebody over him, he is over soldiers, and the soldiers are under him. So you have that classical Roman authority language rather than power language. So you are this, this centurion is under authority. He has his officers who are over him and he has soldiers under him and he now exercises his authority to pray for the healing of one of the people who are under him. Hello? Classical subordination language. The, I think the biggest misunderstanding of language of uh, subordination comes from seeing it in basically... Uh, um, chain of command terms. Now somebody gives the order and then there's a chain of command delivering the order and people you know jump and you say how high. Uh, that's not subordination. That's just obedience. It's not subordination. Um, uh, or people have the idea of hierarchy. Now by the way the word hierarchy is a good word that's become abused and misunderstood. Hierarchy merely means sacred order. I don't know whether you realise it, but what, what picture do we have of hierarchy? We, hierarchy for us is order of power or importance. So you get a kind of pyramid structure. The most important person's up the top, the most powerful person's up the top, and the little people, the powerless people, are the bottom. We think of it in power terms. Okay? Now, um, that's not uh, the basic uh, understanding of uh, this word. Okay? Um, in the New Testament, um, the basic picture is not of this uh, power structure, but is of a body under its head. Now, the head is not separated from the body. The body is not separated from the head. All the parts of the body fit together with and are governed by the head. That's a basic picture. And they form a community. They are in harmony with each other. They serve each other. They work together for the common good of the whole body. So the basic language of subordination, if you like, is body language. That's the, that, that's the way... Uh, Peter and Paul uses it. Uh, you need to have subordination if you're going to have harmony within a community. Somebody needs to be in charge. Somebody has to be responsible. Uh, somebody is accountable. Um, uh, right? You need accountability. You need responsibility. Uh, then you can have harmony. And then it's possible for people to work together with each other for the benefit of the whole community. So subordination is community language. Now one of the problems that we have is that we've imbibed a philosophy of individualism. We see ourselves, and this is the way we're trained to think of ourselves, as individuals, isolated individuals who connect to form relationships and those relationships then form community. Now do you realise that this is a very odd way of looking at life and it doesn't correspond to reality and most people in the world don't see life in this way they see uh, human beings basically as always in community and you can only be a human being within community you are born in community you are conceived in community you're born in community you die in community and you live your whole life communally Human existence is communal existence. Now, that's the old understanding. The modern understanding, which goes back to Rousseau and the people of the Enlightenment, but Descartes, 
going, you can see it in various people, is to see the I comes first, the we comes second. Now, there's a connection between subordination and headship. Okay, so uh, you have, if you like, the relationship between head and body. Um, the body uh, is ordered. All the parts of the body are ordered. So a finger doesn't do what a foot does. A finger is made differently to a foot, and it's, a foot is made differently to a liver. The eyes do something different. Now, uh, within a body, you have many different uh, organs, and they all have their own unique function. They all have their own unique uh, characteristics. So the eye is quite different from the ear, the finger from the foot. They're all different. And yet, what's remarkable about the way God's designed a body? They all work. They all work together for the common good. And if one part of the body is damaged, then the whole body is damaged. If one part of the body doesn't work properly, the whole body suffers. So uh, uh, you get the connection then between body, where you get subordination. There's order, there's coordination, and it only works because there is something that holds it together. There's the head, the mind, which, if you like, supervises things in such a way that everything works together. So uh, headship and subordination are connected in the New Testament. Can you see how it is? You know, it's, 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 a, it's a very powerful image. Now, subordination, therefore, now let me draw conclusions from this. Um, subordination, um, I, oh, let me say, I practice subordination when I accept my given place, my given position in a community and under its head. So um, my immediate head here in the seminary is John Henderson. John Henderson happens to be a former student of mine. I have far more experience in teaching. I've got far more theological degrees than him. I've, had, I've been in the church longer than him. I've been a theologian longer than him. Uh, is he more important than me? Am I inferior to him? Nothing to do with him. This has nothing to do with inferiority. It has nothing even to do with power. It has nothing to do with qualifications. It has to do with what? Order. The order within the community. So my subordination, and I practice subordination, and, and, and I couldn't possibly survive in this community if I didn't regard myself as being subordinate to Pastor Henderson. And my subordination means accepting him as my head, that I'm accountable to him, but he's also responsible for me and the whole community. I accept my position, my location, under his headship in this community. But he's not my head within my family. He's not my head within the congregation. He's not my head within the South Australian district. Can you see that? Um, okay. uh, it's always limited to particular uh, uh, locations. Now, subordinate... Yes, Chris? Well, I was just going to say, um, also, though, in a way, he's subordinate to you in the fact that you're the chapel, uh, dean of chapel, so things that have to do with chapel in that sense, then he sort of comes under your... He doesn't come necessarily, uh, but in a sense there's a half-truth half in that, in that sense, because uh, any person who's a true head delegates responsibility and uh, uh, authorises people, and which means that you can then, in that area, I have authority to operate under my own authority. But I'm still accountable to him. But, he, so, but he, in, he still is subordinate to you in a sense where you can tell him that he's leading chapel on Tuesday. So that's right. Yes, Tuesday. yes, 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 yes. So it's a very complex kind of sets of relationships. Um, yeah. Now, 
one of the thing, differences between, if I can just illustrate, take your point, what's the, one of the differences between the way power works and authority works? Power is finite. It's limited. If I have power, it means that other people don't have power. And the, the, if I can get more power by disempowering other people. That's the way pure power works. On the other hand, how does authority work? Authority can be used to authorize other people. The more you give authority away, the greater your authority becomes. Now this is going to be very important for your work in the church. Did you hear that? The more you give your authority away, authorize other people, the greater your authority. The more you keep, use your authority to keep power to yourself, uh, the less authority you'll have. You'll have power, but you won't have authority. There's two different things. Um, so to take that kind of thing, a good leader, a good head, authorizes other people to be heads in their respective areas. Responsibility is the modern term for it. Yes. Now, um, where was I? Oh, now, uh, what's the difference between uh, obedience, um, submission, and subordination. Now, uh, I learned the, the very clear difference between those three th things when I was a teacher. As a teacher, I could make my students obey me. I had the power to do so. And they would obey me, but they would still be insubordinate. Because subordination is not a matter of action, but it's a matter of attitude. Um, now, insubordination has to do with your attitude to the personal authority. So you had, um, all of you know this from school, you have kids that are basically insubordinate. The teachers can never ping them because they always do what they have to do. Okay? But they are still insubordinate. They don't accept the authority of the teacher. They don't uh, accept the headship of the teacher. Um, what's the difference then between uh, uh, submission and subordination? Submission is that you accept that authority. It, it's one way you can understand it. That's the good sense of submission. But usually submission has a negative sense in our society. It's where you do... Uh, is, is where you... Uh, uh, are forced to do it, to be subservient to somebody with power. So it's not just accepting the headship of a person, but uh, being subservient to that person. Using to yes. Morals. Yes. I know submission slightly different. Now, uh, it's interesting that the word that's used for human beings is that middle form of the Greek verb. Nobody can force you, no human being can force you to be subordinate. It's something that you do voluntarily. It, it needs to be done by yourself. It's a voluntary activity. So vo uh, subordination is a voluntary activity. Now, um, there's two things uh, that follow from this to, to get the full basic picture before we go to the details. Um, now, what's the presupposition that lies behind this teaching in both Old Testament and New Testament? It goes all the way back to Genesis, where God established and ordered an order to creation in order to deliver his blessings to creation. So the purpose of God's ordering of creation is not to establish a dictatorial chain of command, jump and you jump, but he establishes an order so that through this order he can deliver his blessings to human beings. Um, so the order is uh, divinely established for transmission and reception of God's gifts and the Bible teaches basically that there are three divinely instituted orders. This is fundamental to Lutheran theology and ethics. Three divinely instituted orders. The fundamental order is the order of the family and marriage. There's the order of the church. There's the order of 
state is wrong, government. Uh, it's fairly difficult to get one word in modern English that covers everything there. The order of government probably is the best way of putting it. It's not the same as what we now call state. So there are these orders. Now, uh, uh, these orders are established for people to enjoy to receive and enjoy God's blessing. So God, anybody who fits into God's order and is subordinate to the people that God puts as responsible to that order will enjoy God's blessings. What happens then if you reject that order, defy that order? Do you in fact change it? You can't destroy anything that God's created. You step outside of it, and then what happens? The the, you forfeit the blessings. You don't receive the blessings. So it's quite obvious. If, if, if you are, are born into a family, you reject your parents, let's just say, then uh, you not only reject your parents, but you reject all the blessings that you can possibly receive by being a member of the family. If I... Um, if I defy the order of marriage, I'm still married, but what do I forfeit? The blessings of marriage. To put it around, the, put it positively, uh, why is it important that we practice subordination? Enjoy to enjoy the blessings of God. And there's something that needs to be added here, Vaughan. The problem is that we see enjoyment of blessings in individual terms, but God just doesn't want to give blessing to me. He wants to give blessings to community. So it's not blessing my blessing as a husband at the expense of the blessing of my wife and my children, but it's to bless my marriage, my family, my community, my country. Um, remember a couple of Weeks ago, or a week ago, I spoke about that lovely modern and ancient English word, commonwealth, the common blessing. So where you get proper uh, headship with its exercise of responsibility, where you get proper subordination to God's orders, there human beings will receive God's blessings. Where human beings defy these orders, whether they're the order of marriage or church or government, uh, and you could say the same thing applies for natural order, but that's another dimension, um, then human beings forfeit God's blessings. So blessing and order goes together. Um, I don't know if I'm right. Uh, when I was sort of at this stage in my life, uh, that you are, maybe even younger than most of you, uh, the thing that obsessed my generation was the uh, promise of freedom. Now, if you wanted to really appeal to somebody, you spoke in terms of freedom. Um, whether it was social freedom, political freedom, particularly spiritual freedom, was the word. Um, I've noticed with my children that the word freedom basically doesn't resonate with them the way it resonates with me. Um, freedom? It doesn't, it doesn't, in fact they're suspicious of anybody who starts using the word freedom and promising freedom to them. Um, it seems to me that there's a big shift going on that for the kind of, many of your generation, it mightn't apply to you, but if people come from broken marriages, dysfunctional homes, uh, sexual chaos, social chaos, moral chaos, what are people looking for? Order. And I think that that's one of the strongest uh, desires in our community. There's a number of social surveys. Hugh Mackay did a survey uh, some years ago of people under the age of 25 and he identified this as one of the key impulses of people under 25. It helps to explain people's interest in ecology because what's like ecology basically have to do with? Order. What? Order of the world. Any kind of an order? A dictatorial order? A capitalist order? Harmonious. It's a harmonious good order 
a trustworthy, healthy, natural order. Now, I, I think that there is something here that's not only important for you in your own lives, so that you order your life and order it in the way and fit into God's. You don't have to order it. God does it. He gives it to you as a gift, fitting into it. Uh, but there's also something here that's very important for you in uh, your teaching and evangelizing, evangelizing of the generation of young people. You, you won't, this, this stuff that I'm talking about won't wash with the baby boomers. It won't wash with people of my generation. I know. I've been there. Uh, and I've tried to teach this, and basically, immediately, I use these kind of language. I not only get switch off, but I get fierce, fierce opposition and rejection. However, when I've t tried to teach it to younger people, there's a kind of openness to it. And I suspect there's something very important here for you, personally, but also in your uh, work within the church and within the community. Yep. On TV the other night, <clears throat> there was an interesting segment on the news or something about uh, the Generation X is basically there's a cutoff line there, and they reckon that the new generation of Y and below, yeah. teenage, the teenagers that are coming through now, um, instead of being the me generation, they're the we generation. They are tribal, yes. So, which I sort of thought that really makes life pretty exciting for us going yep. there because we can have all these young people. Um, looking for ways to build community yep. rather than yep. build individual yep. individuality. Yep. Yeah, and I just yeah, what, Hugh Mackay says that one of the most, uh, uh, two things about Generation Y and below is uh, tribalism and community. Uh, tribalism and community is the distinctive feature. And the two are very closely related.